because what we're talking about here is extrapolating the precautionary principle to a point where we're second guessing everything. And that's a slippery slope. When we use the precautionary principle out of context in these situations, it's not based on science. It's not based on evidence. It's based on beliefs. Welcome to another episode of Bite Back with Abby Sharp, where I dismantle die culture rules, call it the charlatans spinning the pseudoscience, and help you achieve food freedom for good. Today we are digging into that stage of the life cycle that affects 40 to 45% of people worldwide. One that is steeped in both hope and excitement, but also vulnerability and fear. Messaging about what to eat or avoid, what medications are safe or not, and whether vaccines help or do harm are overwhelmingly contradictory and paralyzing. At a such vulnerable and tumultuous time, never mind hormonal time in many women's lives, myths and half-truths thrive. And unfortunately, this is only getting worse. To help us sort fact from fiction, I'm thrilled to welcome Sabina Vora Miller, known on social media as Unambiguous Science. Sabina is completing her doctorate in clinical pharmacology and toxicology, and a lot of her work has centered around vaccine misinformation, which, my goodness, we got a lot of right now. In today's conversation, we will explore the origins of common pregnancy myths, how they spread, and what pregnant people, support partners, and health professionals can do to navigate a world of conflicting advice. We'll also talk about evidence-based perspectives on vaccines, medications, diet, and lifestyle during pregnancy, and how to counter misinformation without alienating or shaming. So whether you're pregnant, hoping to be a partner, a healthcare professional, or just curious, this is an episode you will not want to miss. Very quickly, if you are new here, I would love if you would subscribe to Bite Back. It really does help me out. And also, if you haven't heard, I have a brand new book coming out, The Hunger Crushing Combo Method, that is now on pre-sale and coming out January 13th. So I'll be leaving links to all of the places that you can pre-order in the show notes below. All right, friends, let's get into it. Uh, Sabina, thank you so much for joining me. I'm very excited about this conversation. Me too. And I'm so happy that you're actually in Toronto and we're in the same hometown. It's amazing. I know that rarely happens. It's just, it's yeah. really nice to be able to connect in, in person. So this is great. Um, so just to kind of set the stage here, because I feel like obviously women's health has just always been shrouded in like so much mystery and like misinformation and just like fear mongering, you know, because historically women have just not been part of a lot of research, a lot of good research. Um, but what is it about pregnancy specifically that just make it such like a flashpoint for misinformation and fear mongering? You know, it's such a great, that's such a great question. And as someone who's also been pregnant, I've kind of gone through this myself, mm. right? And I think that in pregnancy, there te- tends to be a heightened fear and anxiety. You have this responsibility where you're trying to look after, you know, something that you are, that is growing inside of you, right? And like, there is a lot of responsibility that comes with it. And so with that comes a lot of fear and anxiety, second guessing everything you do, whether it's the right thing to do for your baby, whether it's the safe thing to do for your baby. Um, and then also, of course, I I think that because of this, there is a lot of room for grifters to sort of sneak in Mm -hmm. and play on that, right, anxiety. And so you see a lot of misinformation spreading because you have folks who are trying to take advantage of this. Of course, of course. And, And maybe you can kind of help us understand, like, why do we not have great data on women's health and pregnancy specifically when it comes to like what is safe, what is not safe? We're kind of just in some cases flying blind or like you said, just kind of susceptible to what people saying on the internet. Right. And so when it comes down to clinical trials, right, we cannot ethically do a randomized controlled trial in the pregnant population, right? It's we don't know something is safe, we can give it to them, right? Um, there's also, you know, I've spent a lot of time in biotech doing clinical trials, and the issue also is that we don't really incentivize pharmaceutical companies to undertake studies in pregnancy or do pregnancy mm-hmm. registries. So for instance, in pediatrics, you actually get an extension on your patent if you do pediatric trials. 
that doesn't happen for pregnancy. And so because of that, you know, it tends to be more post-market surveillance or post-market registries that have to come into place to actually gather this data. And not a lot of people do this, right? Mm. Um, And then, so what you end up with is because you can't do ethically randomized controlled trials, they tend to be things like observational studies, very often retrospective. So you have things like recall bias that sort of (laughs) plays into it. Um, And so the data is just not robust, right? And so we have, for instance, that the grade approach that we use very often in trying to analyze or assess the quality of evidence. Um, But that typically would put your randomized control trial right at the top. Um, But we don't have something similar to that that in pregnancy where we can actually weigh the studies coming in. So yes, they're all going to be observational, but one observational study is not the same as another observational study. But we don't have a great way of quantifying what the differences are. So they all end up being and the same level playing field when that's not necessarily the case. Right, right. So, I mean, we're seeing a lot of inconsistency in what the kind of results are. People are able to cherry pick um, and it becomes a dangerous world for grifters to kind of sneak in there for sure. Right, and so you also can't prove causality. Mm -hmm. That's the other issue when you're doing observational studies. Causality is something that is going to be very, very tricky, very difficult to actually um, you know, come to. Um, and then the other aspect of doing studies in pregnancy, and actually this is true in everything, but particularly so in pregnancy, is when you're looking at risk versus benefits, we have to look at that totality of mm-hmm. evidence. So it's not just the risks of taking a medication, it's also the risks of not taking a medication. Mm-hmm. That also carries risks. And I think that risk tends to be downplayed in pregnancy and risks of the medication tend to be overplayed in pregnancy. Right. And so there needs to be a balance and uh, you know approach in that when we're looking at all of that. Right. Oh my gosh, I could talk about that risk and benefit. We're, we will. We will go into more of that. And so we obviously if we st- if we've established here that Correlation doesn't, you know, it doesn't equal causation. We don't have great data to show causation when it comes to substances when it uh, during pregnancy. I want to kind of zone in on some of the more kind of controversial substances, and I think the big one that we're talking about right now is, of course, Tylenol in pregnancy or acetaminophen, uh, because the U.S. Um, administration has come forward suggesting that there is a link between Tylenol use, maternal Tylenol use in pregnancy and autism. And before we get into like what the data actually says on that, where did this assertion even come from? Like what what evidence do they have to, to make this statement? Right. And so over the period of the last like 10 years, every now and then a very small study on acetaminophen kind of pops up that shows some sort of an association between the use of acetaminophen in pregnancy and neurodevelopmental concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what kind of transpired what's happening in the U.S. right now is that there was a a systematic review that was done um, by, you know, one of the authors was essentially the dean of the Harvard uh, School of Public Health. Um, And what they did, unfortunately, is they cherry picked some of this. Again, like it comes Mm -hmm. back to the the topic of like not every study is the same, yep. right? And so they cherry picked some of the lower quality evidence and sort of amplified it. And using that as the basis, they went ahead and made this, you know, big announcement, press by release announcement for, you know, um, saying that acetaminophen use in pregnancy causes autism. They mm-hmm. u- literally used the word cause, wow. like it was a causal wow. in there, even though actually if you look at even the systematic review that was done, there was no causality anywhere in that, right? And the the hilarious part is that Marty McCurry, the FDA commissioner, goes out and puts a forward an official statement that, you know, goes to every physician healthcare provider in the US. And in his letter, he actually says two things. A, there's no causal link. So he himself says this. And he also says Tylenol or acetaminophen is like the only safe option in pregnancy, right? right? So even within all of this chaos that they're bringing forward, they're, they don't have consistency themselves and they know themselves that data just doesn't seem to back what they're claiming. And what does the better research show? Right. And so we actually have some really good 
properly done observational studies um, where we did sibling control trials. So the sibling control analyses are really important because we know things like autism, ADHD have a very strong genetic component. Absolutely. So we call this familial confounding, right? And so what they did in these studies, um, this one specific one that actually w was just published uh, a year or so ago, um, they looked at around 2.5 million children and it was a long study. It was from 1995 till I think 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and what they did is they compared siblings. Um, so one sibling would be exposed to acetaminophen in utero, and then they compared it to a sibling within the same family that was not exposed. Mm -hmm. So this way you're sort of controlling for genetic components. And the interesting part with this study is that when they did not control for the sibling, they, they, they actually saw a very small association. Mm -hmm. The second they control for it, there was no association found, right? Wow. Um, and so with this news coming in the US, you know, we have several different agencies and medical bodies who went back and said, okay, we'll look at all the data again, right? Mm -hmm. And so SOGC, which is the Society of Obst Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada said, fine, we'll go back, we'll review all of the data again. And they did that. And they came back and said, actually, if you look at the, re the studies that are done really well, mm -hmm. there is absolutely no causal link that we can see. Mm -hmm. And there is global consensus on this. So it's not just, you know, Health Canada put out a statement, SOGC did. Of course, in the US, our counterparts, which is ACOG did, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine did. Our European colleagues came out and said the exact same thing, right? So there's global consensus that there's absolutely no causal link whatsoever. Um, particularly when you do the studies there that are done the right way, we don't see that link. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I touched on this in my episode with uh, Dr. Tommy Martin um, and just, you know, it's 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 so terrible because now we're in a situation where women are either going to let their fevers go untreated, which we know untreated fevers is an actual risk factor for, you know, neurodevelopmental mm -hmm. issues, including linked to autism, uh, ironically. And, you know, the danger is not just in, you know, avoiding Tylenol it's is what are we replacing that Tylenol with right exactly. and now we have people like Nancy Mace suggesting oh take Advil instead of Tylenol so what is the risk of that right that's exactly it right so it's not like as you mentioned it's not just the risk of not taking it but what are you then replacing it with and so Nancy Mace goes on Bill Maher's show mm -hmm. which obviously is really, really highly viewed, goes on and says, well, there's other safer options to take like Ibupro or Advil. And I'm like, oh, when I saw that video, the audible gas that came out of my mouth, because we have now known for a very yeah. long time that actually Ibuprofen use in pregnancy can cause some serious issues or kidney issues amniotic fluid issues. Um, and then of course it prematurely closes the ductus arteriosus, which is really, really not good for the fetus, right. right? And so now you're replacing something that we know is safe to take, obviously, you know, when it's medically indicated at the right dosages for the shortest duration, which by the way, we say for every medication in and out of pregnancy, that's the same even if you're not pregnant. Yeah. Um, and now we're taking that and we're replacing it with things that we know for sure can cause serious issues for the fetus. And, and, you know, like my question here is what's the end goal? What are we doing here? You know, we're just trying to make women suffer. We are, <laughs> we absolutely are. And like, we're going to see worse outcomes for right. both the pregnant person and for the fetus, the baby, we're going to see worse outcomes with these decisions that are coming from institutions that technically should be most credible, right? right. We look up to them, even in Canada, we look to the U S for mm -hmm. their guidelines mm -hmm. and we really shouldn't be anymore. Right. Uh what a travesty. I want to switch gears and talk about SSRIs, which are, a, you know, a class of medication typically used uh, for depression, anxiety, other mood disorders. Um, and the FDA recently came out claiming that there is an increased risk of birth defects when women are taking SSRIs in pregnancy. What does the best quality research actually tell us here? Yeah, so here is another case where we've actually found, you know, similar small studies that have shown a very, very slight increase in certain birth defects. Uh, but if you actually look at some of the bigger studies, we don't see any issues with cardiovascular, so cardio, cardiac birth defects or other birth defects. The big studies don't actually show this to us. And same with neurodevelopmental. I know that's come up with the SSRIs and SNRIs too. And again, when you look at some good data, the good studies 
do not show this at all either. And then, you know, what we end up seeing are people who either discontinue or do not take their medications in pregnancy, which end up, you know, as we talked about, having even worse outcomes. Right. Um, and we've known that for a very long time, right? And And I myself have spoken to patients who were struggling because they discontinued their SSRI in pregnancy um, and they were not doing well. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's unnecessary suffering. And so again, here, the data does not really show that um, with the big studies, no real birth defect issues. In fact, there was perhaps, you know, a small increase in what we call pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. It was a 0.3% increase, which is really in the grand scheme of things, not significant, particularly considering the benefits of actually being on an SSRI. And the one thing I also want to clarify is not we're not, this is not, you know, a candy shop where you go when you buy your candy, you come out to get SSRIs, you know, you definitely need to see healthcare providers. There's a very, very careful stepped approach that we take. Right. Right. There are guidelines on this. There are stepped approaches that we take where we actually look at non-pharmacologic interventions um, before we actually approach the pharmacologic interventions, right? And that is medicine. This is how medicine is done when it's evidence-based, right? right? Um, And so we're not just giving out medications willy-nilly without actually taking that careful, um, you know, considered approach to the full full health of the person. Um, and yeah, and it's just, there's so much disinformation on this area. And it's just, it's one of those things that's really frustrating because I used to hear this 15 years ago, 20 years ago when I was, you know, working specifically in this field and 15 years later, nothing has changed. We're still yeah. there. We're still, you know, not acknowledging that women's mental health actually matters. Exactly. It's this, it's this constant narrative. This, this is just woven into motherhood, you know, <laughs> like, uh, the myth of motherhood that we just should be all, um, you know, self-giving. And so right. we should suffer for our children, including mm-hmm. our own mental health, just muscle through it, you know, like do whatever's best for your baby. When in fact, not taking that SSRI that you may actually need is not best for baby, right? No, we not actually have, best with baby at all. We actually have research that it can, you know, you know, untreated mental health disorders in pregnancy can in, almost double the risk of preeclampsia, mm-hmm. double the risk of preterm birth, increase the risk of child developmental issues by 80%. So abstinence and is IUGR. not better, right? IUGR is another right. one where the low birth weight too, right? And then we also have issues with, you know, bonding with mm-hmm. the child. Um, and let's not forget that, in fact, um, postpartum and pregnancy-related depression and, and, and you know, um, mental illnesses in pregnancy actually have resulted in very high rates of suicide. Right. And we can beat around the bush over here because... Right. What a, what an actual child needs is a mother yeah. who is actually able to function right. as well, right? And is alive to take care of their child. Um, so yeah, it's not good for the mom. It's no. not good for the baby. It's good for no one. No one. No one. Um, are there specific classes of medications that may be safer in pregnancy? So there are some classes that definitely have more data than others, mm-hmm. but in general, you know, the the idea is that most SSRIs, most SNRIs are considered safe in pregnancy. The issue with which one to take in pregnancy ends up being very complicated because it depends on, you know, your own personal history, what works for you, um, and that has to be a you know much more detailed conversation with your physician. Generally speaking, you know. It's, 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 it, you come to the right medication for you based on a whole host of considerations. Mm-hmm. So again, it's not something that is done and you just walk into a shop, you buy something, you come out. That's not how it is. There's a very careful approach to it. And it's the same with SSRI. So definitely there are some um, that have more data than others. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, that's not the only consideration that has to be taken. Listen for free on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts.